called Gideon. We're going to be looking at the person of Gideon and uh, today talking about the beginning of, of Gideon's life. And so going to be looking at a few different heroes of the faith, heroes in the Bible. Um, man, I love narratives. I love stories that walk through people's lives. Um, and, you know, when I read the book of Hebrews and I see these heroes that are outlined in chapter 11, it says, by faith, Abraham, by faith, um, Moses, by faith, Abel, by faith, Elijah, all these heroes of the faith that the Bible implores us to look at and to emulate their lives, to look at their strengths, our weaknesses, this comparative an analysis. Um, James even goes on to say, speaking of Elijah, that the Elijah was a man like us with a, with a humanity like ours, yet he prayed and it did not rain. The, the, the rains were held back. That it is not only showing that these individuals are heroes of the faith that we are to look at, but that our nature is like theirs. They're human. And what you're going to find as we look at some of these heroes of the faith is that they are indeed human. So there was a conversation had um, not that long ago, a guy named Matt Chandler, a great, great uh, minister, but really um, talked about this concept of how we see ourselves many times um, in the hero's shoes. Um, and he came out with the statement, you're not David. Well, I disagree. You are David. You are Gideon. That's the whole point of bringing up these characters of the faith is to look at them. Now, I understand what he's saying. We're not just to always read ourselves as the heroes, but we're also to see that we're David the adulterer, that we're David the murderer. Um, we can't pick and choose, but that's the beauty of these hero stories is that the Bible isn't like Greek mythology where it just presents these heroes that are impeccable and godlike, but these heroes of the faith that are like you and are like me. Their natures are like ours. They're people. And so we need not only look at their strengths and pretend that we're the hero, but we need to look at their weaknesses. There's a balance involved. But we don't also abandon the fact that we can look at their, these things that they did. And we can read the book of Hebrews and say, by faith, Abraham... By faith, Abel, we can look at these individuals and say, by faith, they did these things. By faith in faith? No. By faith in themselves? No. By faith in Jehovah. By faith in God, David slew Goliath. By faith in Jehovah Sabaoth, David wound his sling back and let it go. And so we can look at their lives and we can ask ourselves those same questions. Do we suffer from the same weaknesses? I say yes. Um, do we match up to their faith? I say most of the time, no. And if anything I see when I read the heroes of the faith is, man, God help me. God help me to be bold and to stand up like Daniel did in the middle of darkness, in the middle of a kingdom that was diametrically opposed to the kingdom of God. And so we're going to do that today. We're going to look at Gideon. Um, and Gideon is a great story because this dude doubts severely. This guy goes through some serious questioning of God and doubting of um, himself and probably God, as we'll look at. Um, but yet God uses him in a mighty way. And he's spoken of in the book of Hebrews as one of these heroes, along with Samson. And if you know Samson's story... I think we could probably more relate to Samson than possibly uh, David or some of these other characters in the Bible. But it does speak of, of Gideon. And, um, and so we're going to look at the story of Gideon. It's a two-part. Today we're going to look at the beginning. Um, next week we'll look at the battle. Um, I love origin stories. I don't know what it is about origin stories. Like I want to see how a superhero came to be. Um, I want to know how Wolverine, you know, got the alloy metal in his hands. I want to know his, 
his suffering origin story of Batman um, training with the monks in the Far East and to know their pain and their, their hardships in life and their difficulties so that later when they succeed, you're celebrating with them because you've been there in the hardship. The Bible does that as well. It takes you on these stories that, that connects you to the character and helps you to sympathize and realize their weaknesses, realize your weaknesses, and to go on that journey with them. Well, this is going to be in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 6, verse 1 through 40 is the text. Judges chapter 6, verse 1 through 40. <clears throat> and what we're going to be introduced to first in chapter 6, in we're going to look at really 1 through... 10. I'm not going to read all of those, but I will we'll read a couple of, of different uh, segments. What we're going to see there is that the Midianites and the Amalekites, they are subduing the land of Israel. Let's start reading there in verse 1 to understand why this is happening, why the children of Israel are suffering, suffering like they are. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor oxen, nor donkey. And so we are going to be looking in Judges chapter 6, verse 1 through 40. And what you're going to start to see here are some of those caves throughout Israel. Now it does give us a jurisdiction or a, um, a geographic region in which this is all happening. It's happening as far as Gaza. The Gaza Strip, you'll, you've probably heard of in the news um, in, in recent years. The Gaza Strip is a very tense place, um, and it is far, as far Israel as you can get to Egypt. It's far south. Um, it's not the furthest south. That would be a lot in the Red Sea, but it's the farthest south on the Mediterranean coast um, to, toward Egypt. And so all of Israel basically is outlined in this section. So the Israelites are planting their produce they're, they're sowing their fields, and when produce time comes, here comes the invading hordes. It later tells us in the verses after this that they came in like locusts. Like there were swarms of locusts that would just descend on the land of Israel and just devour the crops. Not only would they take their, their produce of the land, but they would also take their sheep and their donkeys, their, their beasts of burden that would allow them to sow the fields. So I want you to put yourself in their, their shoes for a second. You're a father. You've got kids. You've got a wife. And you're sowing the field. And every time produce season comes, the Amalekites and the Midianites come in and take what's yours. So the Bible tells us that the Israelites found dens in the caves um, around Israel. This is just one of the areas. This is a, a, the Arabel Pass area. Um, this is right off of the Galilee. So this is central, um, central northern Israel. Um, this has been known for places not only where Jews have sought refuge through the centuries, but where Arabs and Muslims fleeing persecution have sought refuge. And so throughout the Galilee, you have these cave-like areas. You can see where they've even been fortified. I've had the opportunity to hike the Arabel Pass and descend down it. Um, there's sections where there's actually... Um, hooks put in the wall that you grab because you're dangling over 100, 100 foot in a 300 foot, 400 foot drops and you're hanging on to these uh, hand holds that they put in the rocks. It's a really cool thing to descend down that. But when, what happens when they excavate and go into these caves, they find, um, they find that people have sought refuge there. Not only Jews, but Arabs and uh, Muslims alike. Um, through the years, whoever's been occupying the land of the Bible. Um, here's another shot. This is a faraway shot of the Arabel Pass. And you can see all the holes in the rocks throughout that region. And so it's not abnormal in the Holy Land when invading armies come for people to hide. To hide their produce, to hide their children, hide your kids, 
Hide your wives. I won't finish that one. Uh, glory. So, this is not just in the Galilee. This is throughout Israel. This is through um, the Dead Sea region. This is where they find the Dead Sea Scrolls, not around the Galilee, around the Dead Sea region. Um, this is farther south. This is where they're finding um, the, the great cache of Dead Sea Scrolls in multiple caves, not just in one cave, but in caves throughout that area right off of the Dead Sea, um, the Qumran community where the Essenes lived, um, those people who were scribes and transcribed the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, that's a whole other conversation for another day. But what we see is that throughout Israel, there are these places to hide, these caves. And that's what happens, and that's why the Dead Sea Scrolls were where they were, because when Rome invades Jerusalem in 70 AD, and ultimately the war is over in 73 AD as Masada falls, that the people in the Qumran community, when Rome came, fled. They took their valuables, and guess what they did with them? They put them in caves. And thank God they did, because the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and one of the greatest archaeological finds of, of, of the century, um, of the centuries. And so um, you can see this concept of hiding in caves and rocks and dens. And so this is what's happened. And one thing we're introduced to here is this cycle. Now, many people have called it a cycle of sin, um, a cycle of judgment. I've even heard people call it a cycle of redemption. Call it what you will. It's a cycle where God's people are following him. They're blessed. Everything is, is, is good, um, and they are living in freedom. They're not being oppressed by foreign armies. Um, everything is great, and then they sin. They forget their God, and then God takes his hand off them. Um, they leave God's protection, however you want to word that, and then they are susceptible to the hordes of the land who then um, overcome them. We see this in the book of Judges that it's spanning about, a 350, about 350 years and seven different cycles. Seven. Seven ups, seven downs. I don't know which uh, cycle you're on. I think I was on uh, probably cycle four, if you consider rehab. Um, the cycle where my life fell apart. I called out to God, said, God saved me. God rescued me. God saves me, rescues me. I serve him, um, become blessed again, forget his name, deny him, become in bondage again, cry out to him. He saves me, <laughs> sets me free. This is the cycle. Call it a redemption cycle? Sure. Call it a sin cycle? Sure. I think it's all the above. And this is another dynamic of that, that we see in the scriptures that David says, Lord, don't give me too little. Least I steal and profane your name, and don't give me too much, least I forget your name. That there's something about that the Apostle Paul teaches about contentment, about living in that middle ground where, where you're, you're okay with what God has provided you. And um, there's something beautiful about that that, that David understood. That, that even David, this hero of the faith, that's also spoken of in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, this hero, it's put on a pedestal said, don't give me too much, God. Least I forget your name. Least I forget who saved me. Least I forget where my strength lies. We see that Solomon, once he comes into power, um, he fortifies his, his, um, his cities, and Solomon's stables are throughout the regions in these pivotal areas, and the Bible says he began to trust in the strength of horses and, the tr and, and, and trust in chariots. When it came time for battle, he felt comfortable because, well, let's see the list here. I've got this many chariots. I've got this many horses. Um, the, this many are stationed at Megiddo. These many are stationed um, down in the Mediterranean coast. Um, I can go to sleep at peace tonight. That's not where our peace comes from. Not by our horses, not by our chariots, not by the things we own. So there's this concept that, that there's a point where we could have too much. But regardless of why this is happening in the book of Judges, it's happening. It happens seven cycles. Seven is a pretty pr predominant number in the Bible. It's a number of completion and, and perfection. And I'm not too much into numerology, and I don't go too far into that, because I think you can get a little too far into it. But seven is an obvious number in the Bible that's hard to deny. And so they go through this purification, this ups and downs for seven, for seven cycles in 350 years. Guys like Samson rise to power 
um, and liberate God's people. A woman named Deborah leads the nation. A woman leads the nation and liberates God's people with the help of a girl named Yael, in which my daughter is named after, who puts a tent peg through the temple of a king. It's another story for another day. I call JL my warrior princess. She likes to shoot bow and arrows, and we took her shooting guns the other day. She held a Glock 9mm like she knew how to. She's my warrior princess. There's something in names. We're not going to get into that today. There's something special about names. So we see this up and down, and I think if we're honest, we can see that in our own lives, the ups and the downs that we engage in. But this is the beauty that God doesn't forsake us when we're down. What I believe his position should be, forget you. I gave you everything you needed. You squandered it. You did your own thing. Why would I help you? Especially guys like me who cursed his name. Tried to deny he even existed. Why in the world would anybody in their right mind and rational a mindset embrace someone who has spit on them and rejected them? But that's not our Jesus. Jesus embraces the prostitute and the sinner, and he embraces us. And so we move on. We see really there the first... Uh, verse 1 through 10 gives us this cycle of redemption and, and, and falling away, and, and we can see that in our own lives. And now we get on to our first point, which is this divine encounter, uh, verses 11 and 12. Let's read that, and we're going to see, be introduced to, to Gideon and to this divine encounter. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Orpha, which belonged to Joash the Ebzerite, while he, his son, Gideon, threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. Verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, Lord, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. So, you've seen the images of the caves where people hid. Now Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press, the angel of the Lord, which is undeniable in my opinion, is the pre-incarnate Christ. Whenever it says the angel of the Lord, you can almost 100% bake on the fact this is Jesus before he is born into the womb of Mary. It always presents him as a man. If the, with the man's appearance. Um, but there is something different as well that we're, we're going to see here in this encounter. But the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, sees Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press. He's hiding. He's down in a hole. Down in a hole. He's down in a hole. He's dejected. He's rejected. He's hiding the angel of the Lord looks at him and says, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. What the? <laughs> what are you talking about, man? This is a coward. This is our hero, by the way. This is the hero of the story. I love it. You can't make this stuff up. This isn't mythology. This is reality. And if we look at our own hearts and our own lives, we can see humanity and its frailty. So here is Gideon. He's like everybody else. I don't blame the dude. The Midianites come in. The Amalekites come in. Their crops are destroyed like locusts have came in. Their donkeys are taken. I mean, at least leave me my donkey so I can make some more fruits and vegetables for you guys next year. But he is... Down in a hole, feeling so small. <laughs> I'm on one today. I got about four hours of sleep last night, guys. So just, there's no telling what I might say today. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's threshing wheat in a wine press. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. Let me just let that be known. So wheat is, is threshed on a, on a high place. Um, we'll get into talking about John the Baptist on another occasion and, 
and the um, the threshing floor of Aragna, which I believe later becomes Temple Mount. Um, this, these are always on high places, where when you take your winnowing fan, you'll recognize that word from John the Baptist in his proclamations, the winnowing fan is in his hand and he has thoroughly cleansed his threshing floor. Um, when you take the winnowing fan in your hand and the, the wheat on the ground has been rolled over um, by more than likely some type of flat board with rocks placed in the bottoms of it so that it kind of grinds the wheat and separates the wheat from the chaff. You recognize that terminology um, in, in the parables of Christ? It separates the wheat from the chaff, the meat of that, um, that wheat versus that which we throw away. So then the, the wheat and the chaff are separated on the ground, and the way you get that separated is you sift it. There's a sifting that will take place at the end times, the Bible says. You take the winnowing fan, and you put it in it, and you throw it in the air, and the lighter chaff blows away because there's a steady light wind. In Oklahoma, it would all blow away. But you throw it in the air, and the lighter chaff kind of goes off into the breeze. The, um, the meat of that, if you will, uh, obviously I'm using that term loosely, um, of the wheat would then fall to the ground because it's heavier. Um, we see this, you know, in mining and gold mining and things of that nature. You know, obviously things weigh more than others and there's a way to separate them. And so we see that this should be happening on, on a hill where there's wind. So this has to be just a tedious task done in a place where it shouldn't be done, where there's not a lot of room and where there's no wind. I mean, have any of you worked under those conditions? Well, if you're a teen challenge, you probably have at some degree, where you feel like you're doing something and you're not getting anywhere because maybe the tool you have is not at your disposal or the way you used to do it, you know, when you owned your business, it's not right there at your disposal. Um, that free, so I can just imagine Gideon's frustration. But listen, it's better than getting it all taken. But he's a coward and he's in a hole. And the angel of the Lord's response to him is not, look at you, you coward. Get out of that hole, man. That's the rational response, right? His response is to, to call those things that are not as though they were. This is what we see men of God doing in faith as they proclaim to call those things that are not as though they are. To call your marriage that is broken healed even though it's broken. So I know this all too well because when I came into Teen Challenge, I came here weighing about a buck thirty. I hadn't slept in five days, hadn't eaten in probably seven, and I was destroyed. I'll never forget that drive, man. It's my good friend Steve Goss, who I graduated the program with back in 96, asked me if I wanted to take a ride to, to see Bill. Bill was dying of cancer. He looked horrible. He was skinny, emaciated. His, his eyes were dark, and he was, uh, he was beat up from cancer. He couldn't eat because the cancer was in his throat, and, and he had a hard time eating. He had lost a lot of weight. And Steve said, let's go see Bill. Well, I had convinced myself the entire time, listen, I'm not staying. I'm, I didn't even bring a bag because I needed an excuse to not stay. But on that drive down there, as I nodded off the whole way, we pulled up at Bill's house, the house that I once lived in that Brandon Manley now lives in with his wonderful family. And I remember getting out of that vehicle and knocking on the door and walking into that house <clears throat> to see Bill destroyed from cancer. And the reality is I looked a lot like Bill, but I didn't have cancer. I was an addict who was dying inside. And I can remember Bill looking at me and smiling from ear to ear. Because men of faith... Because men of God see those things that are, that are not as though they were. What Bill saw was a prodigal son coming home. What I saw when I looked in the mirror was something different. It was a crack at it. It was a, a father who was no father. It was a husband who didn't deserve a family. When I looked into the mirror, man, I had tried to grow my beard out to, to cover my sunken cheeks. I tried to wear layers of clothing so that I didn't look like a refugee. 
I remember what I looked like when I looked in the mirror. And when people looked at me, I looked down immediately. Because I knew who I was. Destroyed and broken. But Bill saw something different. That's what I see in this text. And Bill ain't Jesus. He's a man with a nature like ours. He's just a normal guy who God allowed to do extraordinary things. But when he saw me, he saw something else. Listen, men, when Jesus sees you, he doesn't see you as you see yourself. We've, we've looked down when people have looked at us. Um, we, we look in the mirror uh, for a second and look away because we are hiding something, because we're hiding an addiction. Can't look our own selves in the eyes. But when, Bill, when, when Jesus sees you, he see, sees those things that can be and will be. I'm going to tell you, man, I didn't plan on staying that day. I don't know what all Bill saw that day. I just know this beyond a shadow, shadow of a doubt. He saw a broken man who was about, whose life was about to change. And in 2007, I entered this program, and my life radically changed. I didn't bring a bag, but when Bill looked at me and smiled, he, it diffused me. All my excuses went out the back door, and he said, Are you ready? That's all he said. And I just broke down, and I said, Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. All the excuses were gone. Listen, God sees those things that are not as though they were. He sees what will be. Listen, I know when I walked in the door that day, Bill probably didn't see this, but I would later take Bill's place. Now try that on for a crack addict who comes in the back door, who's hiding in a hole, in a basement, literally. And God says, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Listen, God can bring you along into that speaking over your life as you go through this process at Teen Challenge to become the man of God that he's, that he's called you to be ministers, missionaries to Japan, pastors, youth pastors, husbands, hard-working blue-collar workers who just punch a clock and love their family and go to church. But he sees who you will be and who you can be. He has this divine encounter. Men, I pray that in this program you would have that divine encounter there's a quote from Andrew Murray. It says this, Beware in your prayers above everything else of limiting God, not only by unbelief, but by fancying that you know what he can do. Expect unexpected things above all that we ask or think. Don't think that you know what God can do with your life because, my friend, I never would have imagined that that broken individual even had a second chance. He can do it in your life. He looks at Gideon and he pronounces who he will be. Why does the Bible say you're more than a conqueror? Why does the Bible say you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? Even though in the moment you're like, I can't. It's not me. I'm not there. Because God sees and God knows. A.T. Pearson says it this way. The word of God represents all the possibilities of God as at the disposal of true prayer. True prayer. Let's move on. Hard questions are then asked. This is what I love. Then I get introduced to a guy that's a lot like me. And I'll try to move a little quicker here. Verse 13 and 14. Let me read that for you. Gideon said to him, O Lord, if the Lord is with us, listen to him, he's a dude like you, why then have all of these things happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go <laughs> in this might of yours 
and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have I not sent you? So, then we see these hard questions. Now, has any, is anybody in that stage of God's calling in your life? Like, God, why? I've been there. I've been to the depths of that. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? If, if you're so good, then why is there so much evil in the world? These existential crises we have of faith that cause us to question things. Here is Gideon basically asking that question. If, well, if you're with us, his response to God's word being spoken over his life through a mighty man of valor was, well, wait a minute, I'm not. And if you're with us, then why are all these bad things happening? And where are the miracles of the past? He asked the hard questions. What I love is that, that the angel of the Lord doesn't just smack the taste out of his mouth. He, he, ha he has a conversation with him. He doesn't just rebuke him immediately. He's compassionate toward Gideon. You're going to find that he's really compassionate by the end of this series. So he's asking the hard questions. Listen, guys, God is not afraid of your hard questions. And this is a place where they can be answered. If you've got a problem with the inerrancy of Scripture, um, then that question can be answered, and we can have those conversations. If you've got a, a question as to why there's evil in the world and why it exists, we can have those conversations, those hard questions. If you've got some more personal things that have happened in your life that you think are unfair, then we can walk through that with you. But don't be afraid to ask the questions. That's what I love about Sunrise. We're not just a program who sits you down and talks to you, but we engage in real conversations in that classroom. Yeah. We go to cities all over America to hear what the world's saying to ignite conversation in the classroom. So that those questions that you want to ask, you can really ask. Because some knucklehead in Las Vegas asked it on the street. You're like, well, I was kind of thinking the same thing. We're trying to stimulate that conversation that's real discipleship. That's not this pretend like, just be a Christian, here's your sticker. But that you've walked through in your heart and you've reconciled things and, and questions have been answered and you've walked through that with the Lord. Listen, God is not afraid of your hard questions. Where are all the miracles? Hmm. So what's his response? What I love is like, Jesus, uh, the angel of the Lord, we'll just quote it exactly from the text, doesn't like go into it. Well, actually, you know, evil exists because of, and, you know, the origin of evil is, he doesn't even go there. He doesn't even go there to why they're being in bondage and all these things. He just simply restates pretty much what he's already stated. Verse 14, let me read that again. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours. What might are you talking about? That would be my response. You mighty man of valor. I've just, I've just tried to give a rebuttal for why I'm not a mighty man of valor and why you're not with us. And your response is that go in this might of yours. What might? <laughs> And you, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he reproclaims that, that I have equipped you. Not only have I equipped you, but I've sent you. Go with this might of yours. And so we see these hard questions. Then we move on to excuses. Oh, Gideon ain't done. And he's not done until literally the night before the battle. That's what I love about it. He just keeps questioning and asking and, and doubting and, and asking for signs and uh, up until the battle. But here we go. Now he's asked questions. Now he's going to make excuses. Verse 15. So he said to him, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites. As one man. What's your excuse? You got ADHD? Your brain cells burn up? You broke, ain't got a dollar to your name? Uneducated? What's your excuse? Because God ain't hearing it. 
God has given us everything we need according to life and godliness. Go in this might of yours. That everything we need, not only in life and for life, but also for godliness, he has equipped you for and he will walk you through that. He makes these excuses. Man, my, my clan is weak. I'm not only is my clan weak, but I'm the least in my father's house. I love how God takes the least and he makes the most. David's out tending sheep. A young man tending the sheep and all of the brothers are brought before Samuel and, and Jesse says, these are my boys. Which one is it? He didn't even consider David. He's out tending sheep. It wasn't even considered, and Samuel's like, yeah, he's not here. Do you have any more boys? Actually, God specializes in taking broken, weak, jacked up things and exalting them and him getting the glory. Because at the end of the day, who gets the glory for the fact that I'm up here preaching? I told you my origin story, part of it. It's not me. It's because he spoke over my life and he brought something about in me, change and transformation. What's your excuse? Let's move on, verse 17. Then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, that's not enough. The word of the Lord's not enough for him. If I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign. That it is you who talk with me. Let me keep going there. Yeah. Verse 18. Do not depart from here. I pray until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread with an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot. And he brought them out to him under the Timbernath tree and presented it to them. I'm sorry, presented them. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour the broth out. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Let me go ahead and finish 22. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So Gideon makes his excuses. He has his doubts. And that's not enough. He wants to know if he's going into battle that God's got his back. And so he asks for a sign. What's the sign that he asks for? He brings this, this offering of meat and broth. He sets it on a rock. And as this picture depicts, the angel of the Lord takes his staff and touches the, the sacrifice. And fire comes up from the rock and consumes the sacrifice. Now, you would think this would be enough. That this sign would solidify the calling of God. I mean, come on, put yourself in his shoes. You've just seen the angel of the Lord face to face. That's been confirmed by the sign that's been given to you. Now, what God has spoken to you, you believe. Now what he's spoken to you, you actually think can possibly happen because you're done with your excuses and your doubts, it appears. And you see that the one who's speaking these words has some strength to what they're saying. This is just some guy with empty words. That what he's saying is real because he's backed it up with power. Because he's backed it up with this miracle. So, let's move on to verse 23. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. <laughs> so I assume dying was a possibility. If it needed to be, a distinction needed to be made that he wasn't actually going to die. 
Um, he's come in contact with the angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord has spoken a word over his life, and yet Gideon has resisted it with excuses, with doubts. And now he's asked for a sign, and it appears that death is an option because he's disrespected the angel of the Lord in some way. That's why I would perceive that he would, the possibility would be death. That he didn't just receive what he said and, and follow it, but needed a sign. Well, he says he's not going to die. Peace be with you. So Gideon, verse 24, built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Shalom. Peace. To this day, it is still an Orpha of the Ebzerites. Now it came to pass that same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and, built, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement, and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood on of the image, of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men. <laughs> so Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. So he's walked through his doubts, his fears, his worries. Um, there's been a sign given. Um, to substantiate that they're the one who's speaking can fulfill what he said he could fulfill. And now there's a word given to him. Okay, you're not going to die, but I need you to do something. I need you to go back to your town and cut down the altar of Baal and the Asherah pole. It says a wooden image. That's going to be an Asherah pole that stands upright. It's a goddess of fertility. Uh, and Baal is the storm deity. Um, you see now that there is this mixing of the worship of Yahweh and foreign deities that they've intermingled with with other tribes that they are now not only worshiping Yahweh but they're worshiping uh, foreign gods and they're worshiping Baal and Asherah in this city and the angel of the Lord's response is go and cut it down now you've just been reassured by the angel of the Lord you didn't die you received a reprieve you saw fire come up out of a rock and consume a sacrifice how should have he responded to the tearing down of this altar? This is how he responds. He goes and gets ten of his homeboys. And he waits till dark. <laughs> oh, Lord. Just wait a second, guys. Let's just wait till it gets dark. Let's do this incognito. And so, how should have he done it? Well, I, I would have liked to have seen Gideon do it differently. I would have loved, of course, there weren't chainsaws back then, but I would have loved for, for Gideon to gone home and got his chainsaw and gone out in broad daylight by his dead gum self and what? What you gonna do? I don't know why I gotta bring a chainsaw into it, but let's just put it in that time frame. Walk out just dragging an axe. Gah! What are you doing? Gah! I don't know. Maybe that's a little prideful. But that's what I would like to have seen. But Gideon, it's like, hey guys, got a mission. <laughs> ten of them. It's ten of his dudes. Oh, man. I'm sure these were childhood friends, people that had his back. Some of you guys had some friends like that that could get into some trouble with you and had your back. Well, Gideon doesn't do it in the daylight with ten friends. He does it in the nighttime. <laughs> Waits till dark, sneaks out there, cuts down the altar, and starts the sacrifice and all these things. Interesting, right? Well, let's put it in our own world. You know, we can, we can easily look at Gideon and say, man, what a punk, what a coward. I think we've already established that. I don't think Gideon would even argue with that. Um, he's resisted the fact that he's mighty and all these things. Um, but how about our own lives as we go home? Hey, man, where are you at? I'm at a rehab. I bet. 
Oh, you know, at the rehab. Or is it, dude, my life's been transformed. Broad daylight. Jesus is the Messiah. I was a drug addict and I've been set free. Is there any of you who will walk out in the daylight dragging your axe to the altar of, of, of Baal and cut it down for all to see? Or are you going to sneak home and pretend like your life ain't been transformed? Or will you announce it from the rooftop? Facebook. Going back into rehab, guys. See you in six months. <laughs> Come on, man. God's looking for some individuals to drag that axe to the town square and chop it down for all to see. What I find interesting is this, you know, a similar result except for Gideon is still in doubt and in fear, as we'll see as we continue this, this series. Um, but the same result happens. The altar is torn down. It's just done at night. Well, I find it interesting that we're in a time frame in America where most people in, in Christianity just don't want to ruffle any feathers. And I get it. Like the whole LGBT, QRS movement, and you know, wanting not to be spokesmen against certain things and just kind of be quiet about it and not talk about what the Word of God says on the issue so that we can just passively get by. I mean, that's, not, that's just one of many issues. I mean, sin is sin. When abortion and the murder of the innocent is, is happening by the dumpster loads all over America as babies are being murdered in the name of convenience and birth control, we're not going to say nothing? We're just going to sit by? Or are we going to speak up that these are image bearers of God, made in the very image of God? Listen. It's really easy to look at Gideon and demonize him, but it's, it's, it's a lot harder to look in the mirror at our own hearts and lives. And I need to look no farther than my own heart. And my own struggles with those things and not wanting to engage in those things when God has called me to stand for truth. Lastly, here as we, as we close... This has all happened. It happens at night. Well, I'll just surmise the rest of this uh, chapter. It continues 28 through, uh, through 40. So the next day, people wake up. They see the altar of Baal and Asherah have been chopped down to the ground and have been burnt. And there's a sacrifice of a bull being offered on it. And they're ticked off. They're angry. Who did this? Bring And then they hear the rumors. I guess one of his uh, ten friends dimed him out because somebody tells and says, hey, that was Gideon. It was Gideon that did it. So one of those ten guys, I don't know, that completely had his back. But anyway, um, quickly somebody says, hey, who did this? They're going to die. And somebody says, hey, that was Gideon. And so, so then they go to Gideon's dad and say, hey, bring your son out here because he destroyed this altar and we're going to kill him. Well, I find it interesting that uh, Gideon's dad speaks up for uh, Gideon and says this. He says, if Baal is really a god, let Baal defend himself. This is really a god that was cut down and thrown into the fire and burns in front of us, let that God get out of the fire and defend himself. Why are you trying to defend him? Yeah. It's the whole concept of dumb, mute idols yeah. and the worshiping of things rather than God. And so then there is this defense of Gideon. He doesn't die, obviously. Um there's some excitement in town. Things are starting to turn. Someone's taking a stand, and we'll look at that in great detail. But what I want you to draw your attention to in this last part of this chapter is that Gideon's not done doubting. This is his, this is his answer to all of this. He wants another sign from the Lord. We just walked through all this. You, you think that would be enough? But Gideon's response is, okay, 
can you do this for me? Can you, there's a fleece. I'm going to put it on the ground. And when I wake up in the morning, can you have dew on the fleece, moisture on the fleece, and no dew on the ground anywhere around it? What I love is that God obliges him, that the angel of the Lord obliges him. And Gideon wakes up the next morning, he looks out the window, or he comes out the door, and he sees dew on the fleece, and none on the ground. You think that would be enough? He takes the, the fleece and wrings it out, it fills a bowl. It's pretty spectacular. But then Gideon does like most of us do, we start to rationalize and justify the miracle that just took place. Well, actually, you know, maybe the precipitation, you know, in the morning is, you know, because it's a, a porous subject, you know, a fabric, and it's going to soak up the moisture more than the ground, and maybe it's soaked into the ground, you know? <laughs> Isn't that what we do? Just like, like start rationalizing it? So he asks again. He's like, okay, can you do this for me? Can you, can, next tomorrow, can there be dew on the ground and none on the fleece? Just to make sure that it's not because it's fabric or whatever. I'm, you know, I'm speculating on why he did that, but I can only imagine. And so he gets up the next morning. Guess what? There's dew um, on the ground and there's none on the fleece. Listen, man, if anything, this story should tell you there's hope for you. There's hope for you in your doubts, in your hard questions, in your difficulty to grasp this, that God loves you, he has mercy on you, that he's looking at you and saying, mighty man of valor, you don't see it yet, but I do. And he's leading us along in that process to form us into his image. I love the story of Gideon, but the story's not over Next week, we're going to realize that Gideon's not done on this journey of doubt <laughs> and fear. And I love the last part of this story as God really shows who's going to get the glory because of this battle. Um, and uh, just excited to share it, to be honest with you. I uh, wish I could just go into it now, but we got stuff to do. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord. God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for knuckleheads like Gideon. God, who... Uh, <laughs> Just like me, man, I see my heart in his heart. I see my doubts. I see my fears. The constant need to be propped up and to, to have signs to substantiate what it is that I believe and the direction I should go in life. Lord, I think if we're all honest that we all could look in the mirror and see ourselves in Gideon. But Lord, it did not separate him, disqualify him, from what you called him to do. And even with all of that baggage, you still called him a mighty man of valor. You still saw the battle that would be won under his leadership. God, and we thank you today that you have mercy and you have grace on us. Lord, and you lead us along. Lord, you, you show us yourself in the word you you've given a sign after sign you've you've spoken into our heart and diffused doubt and answered questions god would you be patient with us but we say like the psalmist remember our frame that we are but dust and have mercy on us lord and as we studied from daniel lord our, our cry is not that we've earned something we appeal to your mercies to your mercies and your grace god because we don't match up. But Lord, you've called something out of us that's not of us. Lord, you call those things that are not as though they are. You see a broken man in doubt and fear and worry. And you see a man of God in the future leading a family, a ministry. You see missionaries. You see, Lord, what you are going to bring to pass as men surrender their lives to you. We love you and we thank you for it. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys.